Good evening. Labour say there's a strong case to vaccinate children aged between 12 and 15 against COVID to avoid further disrupting their education. Ministers have asked the chief medical officers of the UK's four nations to consider the broader implications after the National Vaccines Advisory Body decided yesterday not to recommend jabs for all youngsters in that age group. Our health correspondent Jim Reid reports. In the United States, they have been vaccinating children for months now. France and Germany, too, have been pressing ahead. In this country, though, there is still uncertainty. Government advisers have said the medical benefit alone does not justify jabbing all those between 12 and 15 years old. It's left parents waiting for ministers to make a final decision. If it's going to free up our world more and our country more to give us the freedom and protect our children and things in schools, then absolutely I've got no objection to it whatsoever. We just don't know that much about it, so I just think at the moment, I think anybody above that age, you know, 16 onwards, that, that's their choice. They can make that choice. A child of that age can't make a choice. Around 3 million 12 to 15 year olds live in the UK. 114,000 of those are already eligible for the jab because they live with an adult with a weakened immune system. Another 350,000 also qualify because they have an underlying health condition. The criteria for that has just been widened to include problems like heart disease, epilepsy and asthma that is poorly controlled. It's very confusing. You know, Jean's son Scott lives with asthma. She doesn't know yet if he will qualify for the jab under the new rules. To me, I think it's a, we should have the choice because, as I say, it's the only area of society right now where we come together in, in hundreds and um, and they're unvaccinated and um, so it would be amazing for us and it isn't just at the health aspect it is the mental health aspect as well because Scott is anxious he's anxious about being in school being in large numbers but government advisers were only told to look quite narrowly at the possible health benefits and rare side effects in children Ministers have now asked this man, the Chief Medical Officer for England, Chris Whitty, and his counterparts in the other nations of the UK to report back on the wider implications on children's lives, including education. Ministers have got to look at the sort of the whole range of potential benefits and harms. And one of the things that's been extraordinarily disruptive to young people has been the disruption in their schooling. A source told the BBC the government believes there is a strong case for extending the vaccine rollout to that younger age group. Ultimately, it will be ministers in the four nations who will have to decide as more secondary school pupils return after their summer break. Jim Reid, BBC News. Let's take a look at the latest UK coronavirus figures. There were just over 37,500 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period, which means an average of 35,051 per day in the last week. The figures also show there were 7,541 people in hospital being treated for coronavirus two days ago. 120 deaths were reported in the latest 24-hour period. That's people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. That takes the average number of deaths per day to 112 over the last week. On vaccinations, more than 88% of people over the age of 16 have had their first jab, and more than 79% of people over 16 have had both doses. Some GP surgeries in England and Wales have begun cancelling appointments for the winter flu jab after delays to the delivery of doses of the vaccine. A shortage of lorry drivers is believed to be behind the problem. Doctors have warned it will have a serious impact on workloads and patients, and they're calling on the government to act. Daniela Ralph reports. 35 million people will be offered the vaccine to combat the flu virus this autumn and winter. Those targeted have a higher risk of serious illness if they contract flu. But actually getting your flu jab is now riddled with delays. The vaccine is not being delivered to GP surgeries in parts of England and Wales, causing them to postpone appointments and flu clinics. I think it could be a real issue for patients and for general practice. And that, of course, if general practice is in trouble, then patients are in trouble. Because it's not just a question of delaying it, it's all the cancellations of the many, many clinics, the many appointments which have already been booked in. Securus supplies vaccines to GPs and pharmacies. It's warned that road freight challenges have disrupted their work. There simply aren't enough lorry drivers to distribute the vaccine. The concern is that any delay in delivering the flu jab could have a knock-on effect on the wider NHS. With increased pressure on hospitals, 
during a winter when medics already know they'll have to deal with both flu and COVID. More flu cases potentially caused by delay in vaccines, plus high levels of COVID in the community, plus the NHS trying to deal with other issues, really is a bit of a perfect storm. And I think there's a high level of anxiety amongst my clinical colleagues who are really, really tired and going into another difficult winter. Surgeries are already limiting blood tests due to a chronic shortage of test tubes. Doctors' leaders are critical of the government's handling of the disruption. We're hearing nothing from the politicians and the BMA actually is calling for the government to uh, have a COBRA meeting because within the space of two weeks, we've seen two major crises of cancellations of blood tests and now flu jabs. And we want to hear from our politicians and hear why are there no contingency plans? GP surgeries now face managing further delays and cancellations, as well as the worry and anxiety of their patients. Daniela Ralph, BBC News. The struggle for control of Afghanistan's Panjshir Valley, the final part of the country holding out against Taliban control, hangs in the balance as heavy fighting continues. Hundreds of people have died. Taliban sources say they have seized the area, but the resistance fighters they're battling have denied this. Coast Guards say they believe that two divers have died while exploring a shipwreck off Cornwall. The pair were diving around the HMS Scylla, which was sunk in 2004, to create an offshore reef. A major search operation off Whitsand Bay continued into the early hours of this morning. Cricket and India's batsmen have put up a stern resistance against England on the third day of the fourth test at the Oval. Opener Rohit Sharma hit, hit this six to bring up his hundred. Alongside him, Chateshwar Pujara also scored an impressive 61 as the tourists built up a second innings lead of more than 150 runs. A short time ago, India were 270 for three. And to the Tokyo Paralympics, where Great Britain have won four gold medals on the penultimate day of the Games. In the athletics, Hannah Cockcroft triumphed in the T-34 800 metres to claim the seventh Paralympic title of her career. And Alad Sean Davies retained his title in the F-63 shot put. Meanwhile, Charlotte Henshaw and Laura Sugar won their events in the para-canoeing. Our sports correspondent, Andy Swiss, reports. Domination at its most dazzling. Hannah Cockcroft has never lost a race at the Paralympics and in the 800 metres her supremacy was starker than ever. Cockcroft almost in a different postcode as she crossed the line more than 10 seconds clear. It's a new Paralympic record. And all that remarkably after injuring her hand in the warm-up. I just didn't really think about it and then I came off and I was like, my hand really hurts. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm not sure what it looks like under here, but we're going to leave it under there for now. <laughs> and there was another gold for another of the class of 2012. Alid Davis retaining his shot put title, which he dedicated to his baby daughter, Phoebe. In the canoeing, meanwhile, there was success for the sports switchers. Laura Sugar used to sprint on the track. Now she's doing it on the water and quickly. For Sugar, the sweetest of victories. And there was another for Charlotte Henshaw, the former swimmer edging out teammate Emma Wiggs. Swapping the pool for a paddle, she later told me, turned out to be a pretty good move. I feel very, very fortunate to have found another sport that I love. I, I might have been completely rubbish, so I might not have been even on the team to Tokyo. So it was a complete leap of faith and um, one I'm now glad that I took. Well, the British team have won medals across more sports of these games than they've ever done before. And once again, the venues here in Tokyo brought a variety of success. The British team won its first Paralympic medal in badminton, Dan Bethel taking a historic silver. But the day's most magical moment was in the football. The players can't see the ball, they can only hear it. It has a bell inside. So how about this for a wonder goal? Phil, his captain, choose what a goal! Brazil's Nonato sparking jubilation as his spectacular solo effort meant they beat Argentina and retained their title. Truly a golden goal. Andy Swiss, BBC News, Tokyo. There's more throughout the evening on the BBC News channel. We're back with the late news at a quarter past ten. Now on BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Goodbye.